This is the DDCS version 3.1 standalone CNC controller. This controller replaces the need for a computer and a CNC interface. The controller can connect to four stepper motors and drivers. The standalone CNC controller comes with a panel that you see here, a pendant that can move each axis with three different levels of step increments, and to make connecting this controller to the stepper motor drivers and to the inputs like limit switches and a probe, or outputs to control devices like spindle or coolant, a breakout board is provided that takes the D-sub connector pins and breaks them out to individual screw terminals. Each of the axes has its own pulse or step signal and direction signal for both the positive and negative. A home, limit minus, and limit plus for each axis is also provided. The breakout board and the back of the panel has the documentation that you need for the connections to the drivers, limit switches, outputs, and to power the controller and the pendant. To load G-code files into the controller, a USB thumb drive is provided. An additional male to female USB cable is provided if you mount the controller in a way that limits access to the back of the controller. Let's start wiring up this controller. I'll start with the power. The controller and the pendant requires 24 volts of DC power, and I'm using a 1 amp power supply for this quick test. The live, neutral, and earth ground is connected to the power supply, and the V plus from the power supply is connected to both the 24 plus terminal and the COM plus terminal. The V minus from the power supply is connected to the ground terminal and the COM minus terminal. Let's plug it in for the first time. After the startup, the main screen is the digital readout, or DRO. If you press the page R button, you will cycle through the three main pages, which is the DRO, the file list, and the parameters. In the parameters page, you can scroll through the parameters with the MPG, or manual pulse generator, that is located on the pendant. There are many parameters in this controller, but they are logically arranged in categories. The top parameters are for the, the A-axis designation, units for inches or millimeters, and outputs. In motor parameters, this is where you'll set the calibration, where you'll calculate the number of steps it takes to achieve the linear measurement for the unit of inches or millimeters that the axis will travel. You can also set the direction for each axis in this section. The manual control parameters are for the velocity and acceleration for max speed and manual control. The automatic controller parameters are for the general maximum velocities while processing the G-code. Default rapid speed, the GO code, the Z clearance height, and how to deal with the arc and other miscellaneous parameters. The coordinate system parameters section sets what coordinate work offset you will be using. Spindle parameters will set the M code for engaging the spindle, a dwell for spindle spin-up, default and maximum spindle speed, and the PWM spindle speed signal settings. The home parameters pertain to how fast to travel to the home switches, their signal level, and the back-off distance. The probe parameters contain all the physical sizes of the probe and tooling, probe travel speed, and what you're probing and the probing procedure mode. The hard limit parameters contain settings for the limit switches or proximity sensors for each axis. The software limit parameters allows you to set the travel dimensions for each axis. The MPG parameters contain various parameters for the pendant. The last parameter sets this initial state for the MPG. This value should probably be yes so you can immediately use the pendant and not need to press the mode button to get to the MPG mode each time the unit is started up. The external button section pertains to the terminals on the back side of the controller that allows you to add three buttons for start, pause, and e-stop. The backlash parameters provide you with the backlash compensation values with precision to three decimal places. And the remaining parameters are tool offsets and miscellaneous system settings. You could also use the arrow keys on the panel to navigate the parameters. The up and down will step from parameter to parameter, and the left and right buttons function as a page up and page down. To modify a parameter, navigate to the parameter you wish to change and press the enter button. You will then use the arrow keys to move the cursor, and use the up and down arrow keys to modify the value at the cursor position. Now I'll begin wiring the motors and drivers. In this demonstration, I'll be using two NEMA 23 motors for the Z and Y axes, which will have its own power supply. Each of the NEMA 23 motors are rated for 3 amps, so I'll set these drivers for 2.84 amps. I forgot to set one of the drivers, and when I spin up the motors, you'll be able to hear the difference. For the steps per revolution, I will set these motors for 800, which is quarter microstepping. A typical stepper motor's natural steps per revolution is 200, but you can microstep them, achieving up to 25,600 steps per revolution. The x-axis will have a NEMA 34 stepper motor, which will also have its own power supply. This motor is rated for 6 amps, so I will set the driver to 5.6 amps. 
To vary the steps per revolution, let's go with 3200, which is 1 16th microstepping. You should always determine the microsteps so you can achieve your desired steps per linear inch or millimeters of travel. Let me show you how to determine your desired resolution for an axis. The resolution is the same as steps per inch. The formula derives from the unit's steps per inch or the motor's steps for a full revolution, divided by the number of inches resulting from that full revolution. If your mechanical drive is roller chain, rack and pinion, or belt, the formula is the number of steps per revolution that you would set on the driver, divided by the quantity of the number of teeth, multiplied by the tooth pitch. In this example, we'll use roller chain, with a sprocket having 14 teeth and a quarter inch pitch. We already set the driver for 3200 steps per revolution, so let's see what the resulting resolution would be. 3200 steps per revolution divided by 14 times 0.25 inches, or 3.5 inches, is roughly 914.29 steps per inch. That isn't quite at a thousandth of an inch, but we are using a roller chain which has less mechanical advantage. If we wanted to find out what steps per revolution value to set for a desired resolution, we can multiply both sides by the denominator, which is the number of inches resulting from a full revolution. Let's do an example. Let's say we want 1100 steps per inch resolution for the axis. We can plug in the 1100 and simply multiply that by the linear travel for one revolution, or 3.5 inches, and we get 3850 steps per revolution. Fortunately, these drivers have a setting for 4000 steps per revolution if you wanted to get that desired resolution. Specifically, in the controller, you'll want to update the pulses per unit in the parameter section under Motor Parameters. Select the axis you wish to change and update the value to the new steps per unit. In this case, it's 914.29 steps per inch. Now let's wire up the power supply so we can get power to the drivers and the stepper motors. I'm using 14 gauge power cable and I'm connecting all three power supplies on the same circuit. You may want to put the signal power supply on a separate circuit to remove any noise. Don't forget to switch the input voltage on the power supplies to the voltage you'll be plugging these into. I'm wiring the x-axis motor power supply to the x-axis driver first. The V-plus from the power supply will go to the V-plus on the driver, and the V-minus on the power supply will go to the ground on the driver. I did the same thing for the two lower powered drivers for the NEMA 23 motors. Since there are multiple screw terminals for the V-plus and V-minus, I don't need to double up the wires in a single terminal. Next, I'm connecting the x-axis stepper motor to the x-axis driver using the provided documentation. Since this is a four-wire motor, the two coils of the motor simply connect to their respective terminals. In the case of the y and z-axis motors, there are eight wires. The coils of these motors are separated into four coils, giving you the flexibility to wire them in unipolar, bipolar serial, and bipolar parallel. I'm wiring these motors in bipolar parallel to get higher torque with less voltage and more current. In bipolar serial, you'll need a power supply and a driver with higher voltage but with lower amps. Now I will connect the standalone CNC controller to the three drivers. I'm starting with the Z-axis driver, connecting the ZD positive and negative from the controller to the driver. ZD stands for Z-axis direction. And then connecting the ZP positive and negative from the controller to the driver. The ZP stands for Z-axis pulse, which also means step. I'm using a shielded cable with four conduits for each axis. The shield should be connected to the cabinet grounded to the protective earth or to a DC ground. The former is recommended. Before I go wire the remaining step and direction signals to the remaining drivers, I like to test to see if the motor spins. This way I know I'm on the right track and the others should follow suit. The motor doesn't sound quite right, but that is because I have the velocity, acceleration, and steps per unit set incorrectly. But the motor spins, and I'm set to connect the remaining drivers. While the controller is on, I might as well at least set my units to inches. Unlike most CNC controllers, which typically have two signals, direction and step, going to the drivers, with the option to choose if the common is 5 volts DC or ground DC, this controller leaves no guessing to these connections since all four connections are provided. The direction and step or pulse has both polarities, so all you need to do is connect them directly to the driver. I like to separate the higher power cables and wires from the delicate signal level cables. This is the consideration of orienting and placing the drivers as well as making thoughtful cable runs. Even though I am pretty confident that the driver is connected properly, I still like to power the system and test the axes that are connected. If something goes wrong at any point, I only need to backtrack a little bit. 
To get the controller out of reset mode, you can either press the reset button on the controller or release, and then to press the e-stop button on the pendant. This time, I'll test some different step intervals, even though the parameters are not set correctly yet. I kind of want to make sure that the pendant's working correctly. Now I'll connect the signals to the final driver. I decided to use the red and green for the positive connections, and black and white for the negative connections. Red and black to the step or pulse, and green and white to the direction. I am consistent with all three drivers. Since this is a demonstration and this is not mounted in a cabinet, I am not connecting the shields of the cables to ground. The cables are separated far enough that noise isn't a problem in this example. This is a good time to change my velocity and acceleration parameters. Since I changed the units to inch a little while back, I need to change the velocity and acceleration to a more suitable value that the motors can handle. I'm changing the velocity for all axes to 300 inches per minute to provide a good safety factor. I will set the acceleration to 10, which is a relatively low value. When the motors are mounted to the machine and are under the load of the inertia of the axis, and under the friction of the mechanical drive system, the velocity and acceleration may need to change. If you are using two stepper motors and drivers to move a single axis, you can assign the A axis to this fourth stepper motor and driver to the axis that will be paired with it. Now I can test each motor and listen for anything abnormal. I will test each motor under each step increment level. The x-axis motor sounds very soft since the pulses per revolution is set pretty high. The higher the pulses per revolution is set, the smoother it will sound. However, there is a loss of torque the higher you go. Compared to this motor, I noticed the previous motor sounded a bit rough. I realized that the amps for the previous motor was set too high and not set to the correct amp setting of 2.8. Now that the motors are connected and working, I can move on to the inputs. I will first show you how to connect a proximity switch. Proximity switches or sensors have a few configurations, normally open or closed, and NPN or PNP type. This one is NPN and normally open. Proximity switches have three wires. The proximity sensor requires its own power, and these are brown for positive and blue for negative. The black wire is the signal wire. This proximity sensor can be powered with a voltage between 6 and 36 volts. There are not enough terminals for all the power wires, so it is recommended to add a bus bar, one for positive 24 volts and one for DC ground. In the case of this demonstration, I will simply connect the brown to the positive DC terminal and the blue to the DC negative terminal. I will use the x-axis negative limit for this test. 
This is the limit that is typically at the beginning of the axis. Let's test the sensor. Fortunately, the parameters are already set for normally open operation. It is generally advisable to use proximity sensors that are normally closed for safer operation. You'll see when I put a piece of ferrous metal close to the tip of the proximity sensor, the LED indicates that the sensor is engaged. And you'll also see the message on the controller that the X limit negative has been engaged. Now I will show the use of a mechanical limit switch. I will first connect this limit switch in a normally open configuration since the parameters are already set for that scheme. The lead on the mechanical limit switch that is labeled COM will connect to the COM minus on the controller and I will use the same X limit negative for the other wire. I will now show a normally closed configuration and the parameter modifications necessary. After the controller is powered and ready, you will notice that the x-axis limit minus is always triggered and when the limit switch is engaged, the opposite effect happens. This indicates that we need to modify the parameter under the hard limit parameter category, find the signal you wish to change, and set that effective electric level to high. 